So uh, this is the sixth time uh, in a row uh, that uh, we are uh, uh, giving the Qatar uh, prize. And uh, these awards have really been uh, a hallmark in encouraging the research and the excellency in research and in teaching in the university. So we thank the Qadar family very, very much for this, uh, uh, for their important contribution that enabled us uh, to give this prize. And uh, we truly hope that uh, this uh, important uh, tradition uh, will continue. And before we start, the first uh, uh, thing that uh, I would like to do is to call upon Ariel Porat, Tel Aviv University uh, president, uh, to present uh, his opening uh, words uh, for the meeting. Ariel, please. Thank you very much, Yoav. Um, dear uh, Kadar family, Nadav, Maya, Avraham, by the way, all the three are alumni of Tel Aviv University, and we are very proud of you. Uh, dear uh, Lindsay uh, Bodner, the executive director of the Naomi Prever Kadar Foundation. Dear uh, governors, colleagues, friends. Um, the Kadar Award is uh, six years old, as you have just mentioned. And it became quite quickly to be the most prestigious prize offered by Tel Aviv University to its researchers. Now, uh, it's, um, um, I remember about uh, four or five years ago, I had the opportunity to present to the assembly of the Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities, a candidate um, to the academy. And at that year, that candidate was a recipient of the Kadar Prize. So it was just a year or two after we started awarding this prize. That time, the reputation of the prize was uh, just uh, the community of the university. People outside of the university probably haven't heard much about it. Of course, it's completely different now. And when I uh, presented the candidate, some of the members at the assembly asked me, what is this uh, Kadar, Kadar Prize? And I explained, I explained the concept of the prize and you'll, I'll say a few words about it in a minute, but I believe that that was at least one of the factors, not the only one, that convinced some of the members to, uh, uh, to vote for the admittance of uh, the member of uh, Tel Aviv University who was the recipient of the prize. Now, why the Kadar Prize became so prestigious at Tel Aviv University and, uh, and beyond Tel Aviv University? So I think that uh, generally a prize becomes, or in order to become prestigious, an award or a prize has to meet uh, at least two conditions. The first one relates to the potential candidates. So the potential candidates for the prize might, must be of very high quality, right? That's the first condition. The second condition is about the committee selecting or uh, choosing the laureates of the prize. And um, so it's the first, the first condition is uh, very simple and uh, very easy to understand. So all the 1100 professors at Tel Aviv University are potential candidates. And that by itself shows what, uh, you know, how the first condition is, uh, is met uh, in a very uh, impressive way. Now the second one is about the committee which selects and the uh, and uh, decides and uh, make a decision who are the laureates uh, in a certain year. Now, this committee is led by my friend Yoav, Yoav Ennis, uh, ex officio, as the vice uh, president for research. Uh, unfortunately, this is the last time, Yoav, that you uh, headed this committee because uh, Yoav is, uh, is a term as the vice president ends. So, this is an opportunity to thank you for many things, but also for, for being a leader and leading this committee so successfully and being a factor in creating the reputation of the prize. The other members of the committee, except of Yoav, who is the head of the committee, are the most distinguished scholar at the university. Well, I myself, that maybe shows that it was just inaccurate what I just said, but I myself was a member of that committee uh, when uh, the prize has been uh, founded 
by uh, Dr. Avraham Kedar, together with um, uh, Yossi Klafter, the former president of the university. Um, so uh, imagine how, what a challenge it is for the committee to compare, on the one hand, historian, to compare it to a psychologist or to an economist or to a lawyer and to decide who is better than the other, even though they are in completely different fields. So this is a very challenging uh, task. But I think that the committee every year has done it uh, tremendously because when you look at the laureates of the prize, you can just be amazed what wonderful faculty we have at Tel Aviv University and what a wonderful job the committee has done year after year. And you will see in just a few minutes that the, cho the choices this year were even well, not uh, uh, less uh, convincing and uh, successful than in, uh, in last year's. I just want uh, to uh, say, first of all, to congratulate the laureates of the prize, um, to say that uh, the Kadar Award, I believe, represents the excellence of the researchers of Tel Aviv University, maybe better than any other prize or award that I can think of. And I want, of course, to thank the Kadar family and the foundation, the, uh, uh, the foundation for its generosity in uh, establishing this prize. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing the presentations uh, in just a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, I would now uh, like uh, to present uh, Mr. Nadav Kadar who will uh, speak uh, on behalf of the uh, family. And uh, Nadav Kadar is the founder and CEO of two new digital STEM education ventures, which are called Play Mada Games and Can Figure It. As an owner of Brain Pop and an active member of the company's board of directors, he brings over a decade of management of management experience to the ed tech space. Throughout his career, Nadav has collaborated with talented teams devoted to creating engaging products and students and teachers love and to uh, mentor colleagues. He is a proud graduate of Tel Aviv University's Kellogg's Rekanati Executive MBA program. He strives to impact educational opportunity through philanthropy as a board member of the Naomi Foundation, which he founded with his family to continue the life's work of his mother, Dr. Naomi Prawer Kadar. The foundation is dedicated to reimagining education by empowering educators and promoting leadership in education in order to inspire and nurture the next generation. A longtime attendee of the Board of Governors meetings this year, Tau welcomes and congratulates Nadav on accepting a nomination to be a governor. So, Nadav, please. Thank you, President Porat and um, Professor Hennis. Um, thank you, governors, and thank you, guests. It is an honor to join you here today. While we look forward to the day that the Board of Governor meetings will be held in person once again, one silver lining is that since the ceremony is being held online, it is accessible to a wider audience. I want to thank the selection committee who had the difficult and exciting task of choosing the remarkable recipients of the Kadar Family Award and the many people who helped put this presentation together. My father, Dr. Avraham Kadar, my sisters, Maya Kadar Kowalski, Einat Kadar Krichali and I, established the Naomi Foundation to honor my mother, um, Naomi Prower Kadar Zichrona Levracha, a lifelong educator and scholar. My mother taught Yiddish at schools and institutions of higher learning around the world, including the International Yiddish Summer Program at Tel Aviv University, which is now named after her. Through our foundation, my family supports innovation in education. We are proud to support Tel Aviv University in many ways because we see that TAU as a hub of innovation. The Kadar Family Award honors outstanding research 
scholarship in the sciences and the humanities and celebrates pioneering spirit and hard work necessary to change the world. My family joins me in congratulating the 2020 recipients of the Kadar Family Award for Outstanding Research. Mazal tov on reaching this high level of distinction and thank you for your magnificent um, contributions in your respective fields. Thank you, Nadal. So uh, we can uh, move on uh, to the uh, prizes and the winners themselves. I would just like to say, uh, to start by saying that this year, after initial screening of the candidates by the deans of each faculty, 16 researchers were submitted and recommended for the prize, six in the categories of a senior and 10 in the categories of junior. The committee included the following professors, except me. Professor Adi Arie from engineering, Professor Bernard Attali from medicine, Professor Tamar Herzig from humanities, Professor Michael Birenhak from law, Professor Ori Cheshnovsky from exact sciences, and Professor Joram Cohen from humanities. Uh, the committee uh, selection was based on the criteria of groundbreaking research, exceptional, exceptionality of the researcher, quality of teaching, both frontal and guidance of students that pursue advanced degrees, obtaining research grants from competitive funds, the quality and quantity of scientific publications, articles or books, and the standing in global scientific communities, lectures at conferences and endorsements from scientists of leading prominence. To optimize the selection process, the committee created a short list of nominees, identifying the name of the researcher to be selected as the leading candidate of each category by each committee member. Each of the candidates and his her achievements were then discussed in depth. After all these lists uh, were discussed, the committee members cast their votes and uh, the winners were decided upon. So without further ado, I would like uh, to start with the uh, uh, award of the uh, prizes and uh, to hear from the uh, winners about the research. So first, under the category of senior faculty awardee in the category of sciences, uh, the winner is uh, Professor Ronit Sachi Fainaro from the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology of the Sackler School of Medicine. Before I go into the reasons why she was awarded the prize, because she is in uh, biology, uh, I must uh, introduce a joke on biology. So there is the story about. Uh, a visitor that comes into the zoo and uh, he goes uh, to the cages and he sees the caretaker uh, standing next to the lion's cage throwing in a little bit of meat that the lion with one bite finishes it and then next to it there is a fox cage and he throws in a huge amount of huge bones and stuff and the fo fox cannot eat it so he comes and asks the caretaker why are you doing it like that and he says, well, look at what is written on the cages. And he, he looks and he sees that on the lion's cage, the writing, it says fox. On the fox cage, the writing says lion. So he says, well, why won't you switch the uh, 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 signs? Why, why did you do it? You, did you do it this way? He said, well, we did it this way because when the lion arrived, only the taken, uh, the position, of a fox was free. So we gave it the, the fox uh, position. And when the fox arrived, only the lion position was free. So he says, well, switch the uh, signs. He says, well, the manager of the zoo does not allow us to do that. He says, why, why not? Says, well, because he is an asshole or he is an ass. As, uh, he says, well, why, why did you put an S uh, as the director of the zoo? He says, well, because this was the opening that we had free when he arrived. So on this zoology related uh, joke, I would like uh, uh, to congratulate Onit Sachi Fainaro, 
who was awarded the Kadar Family Award for her groundbreaking work on tumor progression and angiogenesis and on the development of multivalent polymeric nanomedicine to target cancers. She has won many honors. She is in the board of directors of TEVA. Uh, she has authored close to 100 scientific articles and has registered many patents. Moreover, she has educated and is mentoring a huge number of students. And for all of this, she was awarded the uh, Qatar Family Prize. So, Ronit, please. Thank you, Av, and thank you uh, to the Qadar family for this great honor. Um, you're probably wondering what a cancer researcher has to do with the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, as this uh, is the world's greatest challenge now. So take a look at the coronavirus and a melanoma cell. What do they have in common? Actually, more than meets the eye. It's all about proteins. It's proteins that can activate the immune system against them. So if for melanoma that I've been working for the last uh, five years has a MART1, a melanoma antigen, for the coronavirus, we can see the spike here sticking out of the, of the virus that gives it its name of the corona, and both proteins are immunogenic, meaning that they can activate the immune system against them. I'll get back to it in a few minutes. So I will start with cancer and mainly on a phenomenon that I heard about a few years ago, and I was fascinated by it. A melanoma that usually grows in the skin sends a metastasis, meaning that it sends cells to the brain. Actually, about 90% of patients present brain metastasis at the post-mortem analysis. I found this terribly disturbing because there is the blood-brain barrier that shouldn't allow these cells to cross them. And what we figured is that it could be that the secretion of these proteins that I just mentioned can cause brain inflammation that promotes the establishment of brain metastasis. So how did we test this hypothesis? We wanted to understand how do cancer cells communicate with brain cells and we first created a model in mice that have the primary uh, melanoma in their skin that sends spontaneously metastasis to the brain. Then we sequenced and characterized the different genes and proteins in those uh, metastatic cells compared to the primary ones. We uh, found the hit, uh, several hits of proteins, and we tested their function, meaning that if we block them, can we uh, inhibit the tumor progression. Once we had a validated druggable target, we entrap it into a nanomedicine that can direct it directly only to the tumor site without affecting the normal healthy organs, uh, hence not uh, causing uh, side effects, and then test them in, uh, on cells in preclinical studies, then in mice, and hopefully move to the patients. This is an in-depth process that takes five to 10 years. This is a really long time. And about a few years ago, we had some uh, surgeons, neurosurgeons actually joining the lab, and they suggested, why don't we reverse the whole process? Start from our operating suite, take a chunk of the tumor, implant it into mice, and reverse everything. This expedite things and we could do it within six to nine months. But still, this is way too long for a cancer patient with a brain metastasis. So we thought out of the box, how can we expedite it further and have a rapid, reproducible, and robust manner to study this and develop new drugs? So the idea came from a multidisciplinary approach that can happen only or at least in a very good way in Tel Aviv University with its nine faculties, where we join uh, engineers, biologists, uh, medi um, MDs, and uh, computer scientists, and even an architect in our lab. 
So we started with the notification from the surgeon telling us that there is a patient coming with a brain metastasis. Then we got the MRI image. We did the image analysis. We converted the files to a 3D printer uh, files that it can read. And on the day of the surgery, we take a chunk of the tumor and we implant it into the hydrogel that we can then print exactly as the tumor looked in the patient brain. So now we have about 20 mini tumors that have blood vessels in them, similar to the way they were uh, from the cells they had in the uh, patient. And we can flow blood here, the green blood that you see here, it's a frog-like one, that, and test the medicines that we create uh, and synthesize in the lab. This is how it looks from outside. This is the mini brain that we print. Inside what we see here is the blood vessels with all the different cells and the cancer cells in the area. And what you can see here inside is actually the blood vessels in the brain where in blue you can see the melanoma cells just on the route to internalize into the brain tissue and invade them. This simulation-based process takes only two weeks so we can expedite things and get to much better results much faster and create drugs for prevention, like vaccines, intervention to treat once we already have the, uh, the disease or regression when the patient present with the, the brain metastasis. So we started with the vaccines, with the prevention, we vaccinated the uh, mice towards the, this MART1 uh, protein. Remember that sneaky protein that we mentioned in the beginning? And we collected the immune cells from the mice that were vaccinated. And what you see here in red are the melanoma cells, the control group, how it grows in size. And this is when we culture them together with the immune cells from those activated uh, with the vaccine from the mice. When we looked at survival of these mice, we could see that the nanovaccine prolonged the survival of the mice compared to the untreated ones. So going back to uh, COVID-19, if we look at the process, we have here the nanovaccine that once we inject it, they are at, come to the side, the immune cells in purple, go to the lymph node and send soldiers. Those soldiers are the T cells that are being activated against that protein that sticks out of the melanoma cells that you could see here. At the same time, they also create antibodies using the activation of B cells. What happens in COVID-19 is this time, instead of putting pieces of the proteins of the melanoma, we put pieces of the spike protein and activated the immune cells to attack the uh, coronavirus with the antibodies and also the lung cells or other cells that were infected with the COVID-19. So this is a multidisciplinary approach that starts from bedside, goes to the bench and back to the bedside hopefully soon. This work was possible thanks to a wonderful group of brilliant scientists coming from biology, medicine, engineering, and chemistry, showing that the multidisciplinarity is so vital to, to get uh, results in an amazing time that shows you that when you drain the water from the ocean, you'll find out that all the islands are connected. Thank you for your attention and thanks to the Kadar family for this great honor. Thank you, Runit. And uh, a wonderful, really a one, wonderful piece of work. Okay, the next winner uh, is from uh, under the category of senior faculty from humanities. And uh, under this category, uh, the winner is Professor Ishai Rosensvi from the School of Jewish Studies and Archaeology, Faculty of uh, Humanities. Uh, on this issue, by the way, uh, there is this uh, religious uh, person in the diaspora going to a neighboring uh, small town to visit his friend, who is the Gabai of uh, the synagogue there. So, uh, he doesn't know exactly where he lives, so he stops someone on the street and say, could you tell me where Chaim the Gabai lives? He tells him, ah, this guy, uh, Chaim, the one who takes the last penny 
uh, from the widows, okay, go to the right, turn to the left, and then ask again. Okay, he gets there, he asks again, where does Chaim the Gabai lives? And they, they tell him, ah, Chaim, this guy who takes the last piece of bread from the mouth of the orphans, go to the left, go to the right, and you will find his house. Okay, he goes, he finds, finally finds him, he falls on his neck and he says, Chaim, you know, on the way here, uh, I ask where you are and all these responses that I got, got me wondering, uh, there is not this much money in the position of Gabai and all these things that uh, people say, uh, why, why do you, did you take this position? So he tells him, yeah, there is not a lot of money, but the honor, the honor, a kavod, okay? So, so this is, uh, why did uh, Ishai Rosensvi, wh why was he selected by the committee for this prize? So he is awarded the Kadar Family Prize for his outstanding contribution as a Talmudic scholar. He is noted for his groundbreaking work on rabbinic attitudes to gender, which culminated in the book on the Sota ritual and his work on reconstructing the anthropology of the rabbi's Yetzel discourse and the economy of gender. His high standing as a scholar was already noted when he was awarded the prestigious Alon Fellowship and he is a mentor of numerous uh, master and PhD uh, students. So, uh, Professor uh, Ishai uh, Rosenzvi, let us hear uh, what uh, you have to say about your research, please. Thank you. So, um, let me just share the screen. Here we are. Okay, so um, first of all, let me also thank the uh, Kadar family for this generous and prestigious uh, prize that goes exactly to what we need most, which is supporting research. So it is research that we're going to talk uh, about uh, today. But uh, first, let me also thank uh, Daphna Goldmelchior for uh, the assistance in preparing this presentation. Okay, so let's roll. Um, so, yeah, Paul, the founder of Christianity, approaches in the mid-first century CE, the community of Christ believers in Rome as Gentiles. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles, ethne, for I am an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, scholars teach us that although he was, you know, writing in Greek to communities across the Mediterranean, he kept thinking as a Jew who was educated in Jerusalem. And as a Jew, Paul was used to dividing humanity into these two parts, meaning Jews versus Gentiles. And this is, by the way, a wonderful and very influential uh, scholar. But in the Bible, we know that Goy is not a Gentile, but a people, nation. And Israel, Israel too is a Goy, right? A holy Goy, Goy Kadosh, holy people. So how did it change and, and why and when? So basically we're asking two kinds of questions. We're asking how and when was the Goy born, but no less importantly, we're asking what was before, what preceded the Goy. But in order to understand the meaning of these questions, we need a very short methodological introduction. Historians of ideas ask not only about physical and political entities, but also about concepts. Even these concepts, or maybe especially these concepts that seem to us most natural, like sexuality or religion. So we ask, what was there before sexuality? What was there before religion? Not before a specific type of sexual behavior or specific kind of religion, but before we had um, these very concepts that arrange a reality in a novel way. So this is exactly the type of question that we, meaning Professor Adi Ophir and myself, asked in a book that we've uh, we've been working on for the last decade, and that was published in Oxford uh, last year. How was the Goy born? Not the different attitudes toward the Goy, but the very concept that 
uh, 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 that arrange that split humanity into these two binary dichotomous part of Jews versus Gentiles. There is nothing evident here. Uh, French, a German, a Russian do not have a unified concept to all those who are not them. The ancient Greeks did have, right, a barbarian. So we have to understand how and why it was created. Now let's look for a second closer at the cover of the book. This is part of a painting. And here's the painting. It was not just, uh, uh, um, it was not just selected for aesthetic reasons. Uh, actually, it tells part of the story. This is a fresco, a wall painting uh, from a synagogue, uh, a third century CE synagogue in Dura, a city at the eastern end of Syria by the border with Persia. And the scene is the story of Esther, the, the, the book of Esther. So you can see here uh, Mordechai and Haman, and here is uh, uh, um, Achashverosh, and here is the, the, uh, the um, Esther and, and Achashverosh court. But who are these? These are the, the Jews, the Jewish people, and they greeting Mordechai. Ve'ayir shushan tsa'ala ve'samecha. Susa was cheerful. But note that they are dressed like Greeks. Right? They're with wraps like toga, while all the others are dressed with a uh, pants and coats, the Persian uh, dress. Why? This is not realistic. Jews in Persia did not dress like Greeks. It is meant to distinguish them from their surrounding. So this is an attempt, a pictorial attempt, maybe the first one in history, to picture Jews. And it is based on distinctions. So it is distinctions that we are looking for today. Now, pictures are fun, but most of our work is on text in order to understand how and when was the Goy born and mainly what preceded it. Now, let me tell you a secret. There was no one happy family before the Goy was born, but different kinds, different ways of making distinctions before the Goy took over, the Goy concept took over and created this one total uh, uh, distinction that erased all others. Let me give you a quick example of one such distinction that was erased with the birth of the Goy. Different attitude toward different nations. In the Torah, different nations get different treatments. So for example, an Ammonite or Moabite are rejected from the community for political reasons, you see, because they did not meet you with food and water on your journey out of Egypt. But an Edomite or an Egyptian are accepted, again, for political reasons. An Edomite is your kin and an Egyptian, your alien residing in his land. But when the rabbis came, these distinctions were erased. They created this historical story, this historical myth that Sanherib, the king of Assyria, meaning in the 8th century BCE, right, mingled all the nations together, mixed all the nations, and so this distinction is obsolete. And, and, and actually, this distinction were erased from halakha, from Jewish law, and the goy became this one and only category that matters. Now, unfortunately, I won't be able to give you here the answer how and when it happened and what's the role of Paul and what's the role of the Talmud in that. For that, you'll have to read the book. I will say this is a much trickier story than we've expected, but that's what we're doing research for. But here's homework. The role of historiography is to relativize, to expand the limits of the possible to show that what seems to us natural was born at a specific uh, time in history and so can also change. So what would change in Judaism if the Goy will not be there as its opposite? How would the Jew look like if it won't be part of a dichotomous structure but part as multiplicity? You'll think about it and I'll keep trying to decode it in my research. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, 
we are moving on to the next uh, uh, category. And this is the category of uh, junior faculty awardee from sciences. And uh, this uh, prize goes to Professor Tal Ellenbogen from the School of Electrical Engin Engineering. And uh, of course, uh, he is working on uh, light matter interactions. And light matter interactions calls immediately for an Einstein funny story. And the story on Einstein is that uh, he was, he had a driver, he didn't drive, and his driver was taking him uh, around to all his lectures. And uh, then what would the driver do when Einstein is giving a talk? Uh, he would sit in the back of the audience. After many drives like that, one day Einstein tells his driver, you know, today I don't feel like giving the talk. You have heard my talk so many times, you give it instead of me. The driver said, are you out of your mind? How can I do it? He said, well, you are not stupid. We talked a lot. You sat in all my talks. You can do it. Okay. The driver goes up. Einstein is sitting at the back. And the driver is giving an, an excellent talk. And then he answers questions. And, uh, you know, everything goes fine. But then suddenly comes a question that he doesn't know how to answer. So he says, one moment. This is such a simple question that uh, even my driver in the audience can answer it. Okay. So <laughs> on this happy note, uh, Professor Tal Ellenbogen is selected for the Kadar Family Award uh, for the, his unique con contribution, uh, the unique contribution of his studies on nanoscale light matter interactions. His focus is on leveraging these studies to develop advanced, active, small scale, ultra fast and efficient optical devices that will push forward future technologies, technologies and drive new scientific discoveries. Professor Ellen Bogan is a highly valued mentor to his many masters and PhD uh, students. So uh, we are looking forward to hear about Tal's research. Please, Tal. Okay, one moment. Okay, thank you very much, Joav. Optical technologies uh, are all around us. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the greatest inventions in the history of uh, humanity are related to our ability to control light and uh, our understanding of light matter interaction. And here we can see several examples of, of that. In my lab, uh, we are studying a uh, nanoscale light matter interaction because uh, when light interacts with nanostructures, it interacts in, and behaves in unconventional ways. So first, we are interested to unveil the fundamentals of uh, this uh, interaction. And then uh, we are interested to use this understanding in order to improve all these existing uh, optical uh, technologies and to develop the optical technologies of the future. Uh, to understand the, the, the relation between light and the uh, matter, the nanoscale, we first need to understand that light is essentially an electromagnetic wave. It is composed of uh, oscillating electric and uh, magnetic uh, field that form a wave that travels at the speed of light. An important feature of this wave is the wavelength, which is basically the distance between one peak and another, another peak of, of the wave. This uh, feature is important be because light be behaves completely differently if it interacts with an object that is much larger than the wavelength or with an object that is much smaller than the wavelength. In the first case, if the object is much larger than the wavelength, we have conventional uh, wave dynamics. This is the conventional interaction of light with objects. However, if the object is much smaller than the wavelength, even if it's very complex, made of, out of many, many parts, everything together interacts with a single stroke of the electric field, which leads to a completely different behavior. So uh, we basically have two different regimes. One, the conventional uh, so-called distributed system regime, and the other, this uh, unconventional uh, lumped element regime. Why uh, going to nanoscale? Uh, we know that uh, one nanometer is basically uh, one billionth of a meter. And uh, the relation comes uh, from, uh, with respect to the optical wavelength. 
Uh, we know that the uh, nanotechnology, the revolution of uh, nanotechnology basically now allows us to fabricate structures that are at the scale of a single or a few uh, nanometers very precisely in one dimension, uh, two, two dimensions, and to some extent also in three dimensions. This revolution basically placed uh, most of the optical uh, domain, including the ultraviolet, visible and infrared, regimes into this new sort of interaction, new sort of lumped element regime. So this gives us the ability now, and this basically opened the door for us to practically explore these new dynamics and try to use these new dynamics to uh, improve and uh, uh, develop new optical technologies. What can we do with that? For example, we can create uh, artificial optical materials that are also called the uh, metamaterials. How do we do that? Uh, we start with a small uh, nano inclusion, a very uh, small inclusion that is uh, much smaller than the optical wavelength. We can call it a uh, meta atom. Then uh, we understand the interaction of light with this lumped element and add more uh, lumped elements uh, around it to uh, build a material. And if we understand the interaction with the single uh, nano inclusion and all the crosstalk between these different nano inclusions, then we can design the optical properties of the material by uh, our understanding rather than by, or by the design and uh, rather than by the chemical uh, uh, composition. Here uh, we can see an example of uh, so-called uh, two-dimensional nanostructural material, so-called metasurfaces. So you can see that uh, we can use different uh, inclusions. Uh, these images are taken under the electron microscope because under the optical microscope, we cannot see uh, this high resolution. Under the optical microscope, these uh, metasurfaces act like uniform material that we could control their uh, artificial uh, optical properties. So I will show you three examples of uh, what we can do with that. Uh, first example will be uh, uh, to show how we can use this uh, notion, this concept to control visible light. So together with the, our colleagues at the Weizmann Institute, we came up uh, with this concept of a multi-layered, multi-spectral uh, metamaterial. We take different uh, nanostructured layers where uh, each layer is uh, dealing with a specific spectral region in the visible domain, specific color, and all together we can come up with uh, exciting new functionalities and very, very thin optical elements. So for example, uh, we can create a very, very thin uh, lens uh, the thickness of the optical element is uh, uh, smaller than uh, half a micrometer. Basically, uh, this is uh, uh, like a one hundredth of a human hair in thickness. And we show that using this concept, basically we can take the very, very thin lens and uh, focus uh, white light. With the conventional material, if you uh, take these thin lenses, you cannot focus white light you spread the color in space. So this can form new uh, technology for uh, cameras, to miniature cameras, uh, imaging devices, and so on. We can also uh, uh, shape the optical uh, spectrum as we would like in space. Uh, for example, we show that uh, using white light, we can make only the green part uh, focus while uh, shaping the red light as a vortex around it. And this opens the door to new types of super-resolution microscopy. This technology is now being used by us to uh, try and develop new types of uh, ophthalmological devices and contact lenses, and uh, this project is uh, generously funded by the Schmidt uh, Future Program. Another example is how we can use these concepts to convert the energy of light, convert the energy of photons. We can uh, shine these metasurfaces with uh, infrared light and use design and energy conversion process on the metasurface to upconvert the energy of photons from the infrared to the visible and control this visible radiation. So here you can see example of visible light that we created uh, this way in this night diffraction pattern. We show that we can also scan, actively scan the visible light out of the metasurface. This is important for uh, scanning application, LIDARs, optical communications, uh, optical commute, computing. And we can also create these non-linear, so-called non-linear optical elements where we shine them with infrared light and convert the energy to the visible and can do something. In this case, they can focus light. So this can be also 
good for optical computers, uh, signal processing, and all sorts of integrated optics applications. We can use this concept for another process, for example. We showed that we can take this infrared radiation and now design the, the metasurface also to down-convert the energy of photons and create photons, less energetic photons, and in this case to create what is called terahertz light. Terahertz light or terahertz radiation is radiation between microwaves and infrared radiation. This is a very important type of radiation, but it is relatively challenging to generate and control. Yet it has many uh, interesting applications. For the example, it is uh, uh, good for remote detection of material, inspection of uh, drugs and explosives, for example, inspection of electronic chips, even art pieces, uh, paintings, seeing uh, layers in paintings, and also for uh, fast wires communication, but it's very hard to generate and control it. Very recently, we uh, showed that the concept of metasurfaces can be used to convert light to the terahertz regime and to be able to control it in new and uncomparable ways. I don't have time to explain about this research, but there is a nice uh, video that we have on uh, YouTube uh, that is called Terahertz Waves, the missing electromagnetic wave, a nice animation that uh, describes this uh, process. And uh, with that, uh, I would like uh, to end and uh, thank the Kadar family for uh, giving me uh, this award. Uh, I have the uh, certificate here. I'm very excited about it. Uh, thank you for supporting research here at Tel Aviv University. In my case, the, the award money will go to support my research students, so uh, they are uh, grateful as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tal. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we have the last awardee uh, of uh, this year under the category of junior. Uh, faculty from the humanities wing uh, and uh, 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 the winner is uh, Professor Elite Ferber from the School of Philosophy, Faculty of Humanities, uh, whose expertise is on emotions. And uh, you know, on emotions you can tell many things at this time. I, what I chose is actually something that uh, expresses our emotions about the government, which recently I think are at a, a peak. Um, and the story is uh, about three doctors uh, who are all surgeons and they have a conference and they argue which type of patients uh, are the best to operate upon. The first one says, I like to operate, I like best to operate on electricians. They say, why? He says, you open them up and everything is color coded. The veins are uh, uh, blue, the arteries are red, the tendons are black. You know what you are doing. You are not going to cut anything by mistake. The other one says, you know, I mean, you are right that it's easy, but I like better uh, to operate on uh, uh, the finance ministry clerks. He says, why? He says, well, you open them up. What you find is everything is organized uh, in a, a, uh, little books, little booklets. So this is the booklet of the heart. This is the booklet of the uh, uh, bones. This is the booklet of the liver. So it's easy. Uh, the third one says, I, I uh, don't agree with you. I think the best ones to operate upon are politicians, especially the Knesset members. I say, why? He says, well, politicians are, are the simplest. He says, what do you mean the simplest? Say, well, you open them up and what do you see? They have no heart. They have no guts. They have no spine. And the best part is that the head is interchangeable with the butt. Okay. So. On this note, uh, I would like uh, uh, to describe uh, wha for what uh, Elite Faber uh, got the prize. And she is named for the Kadar Family Award for her outstanding contribution to the study of the philosophy of emotions, which she examines from a historical perspective with emphasis on language, the borders and the potential of the linguistic expression of emotions. She is already defined as a recognized leader in her field of research, and her studies had an international impact. In spite of her relatively few years in the university, she has mentored a significant number of students, 11 master's students and three PhD students already. Uh, 
So for this, uh, Elite is uh, awarded uh, the Qatar Prize, and uh, we are looking forward to hear her description of the research. Elite, please. Thank you very much, Joao, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the Qadar family for your generosity and for the belief in my work. Our work as scientists and theorists is lonely and sometimes painful. So when someone kindly invests in it and in us, it is both very, both very validating and much appreciated. So thank you very much for that. As human beings, we've all experienced pain. It can be a passing headache, a traumatic blow to the toe, a prolonged back pain or a chronic illness. We all feel that we have an intimate connection with pain and we all feel that we know something about it. The first thing we can say of pain is that it is destructive. It destroys our bodies, our minds, our sense of selves. It shatters our world and sometimes our future. A second characteristic of pain is its violence and the force with which it isolates us. When we are in intense pain, we feel that we are separated from ourselves, from our plans and memories, but more importantly, from the world around us and from other people in it. Our whole existence seems to shrink to that of mere pain as it takes over everything and leaves no room for anything that is not pain. This is why we always feel that even when there are people around us, when we suffer, we suffer alone. But there is another protagonist in this story, and this is language, the most central, dominant, but also invisible apparatus that enables us all to communicate with one another. Virginia Woolf famously wrote that the English language can express the richness of Hamlet and Lear, but has no words for the shiver or the headache. For pain, she writes, words are lacking. And indeed, it seems that pain not only destroys our bodies, but also our language. We feel we cannot communicate our pain to others, from our doctors to our loved ones. We feel that we can never fully express it, that no one can understand us. This notion of the dichotomous divide between pain and language is far from new. There is a long history in Western philosophy in which bodily pain is described in similar ways, as destructive, violent, and mainly as an experience that robs our language from us, turns us into speechless animals. This tendency characterizes philosophy's preference for the rational, the linguistic, and the theoretical, but presumably makes us human, over other so-called lower aspects of our existence, considered to be closer to the immediate and to the animal. But is this really the whole story? Is pain only our rival, a destructive agency that takes over everything that is human in us and destroys it? Is our ideal state indeed one that is completely without pain and suffering? And moreover, would we want a language that is completely devoid of pain? And is this at all possible? Would we want our relationship with others to be only about happiness and communication? Or is there perhaps something about the encounter with others that is not only destroyed by pain, but rather deeply rooted in it and perhaps even deepened by it? In my research for which I won the Qadar Prize and especially in my recent book, Language Pangs on Pain and the Origin of Language, I challenge these conceptions, especially the paradigm that pain and language are mere enemies forming an either or structure at the middle of, of which stands the fragile human body. I reconsider the relationship between pain and language, and I turn my attention to the different ways in which pain speaks rather than silences, is fruitful and active rather than simply annihilating and destructive. I'm a philosopher, so I address these questions not from a medical, psychological, or any other therapeutic point of view. I'm not interested in avoiding, preventing, or curing pain, but rather in opening it up, in seeing what it can teach us and about our understanding of human existence as a whole. I do this by telling the story of a philosophical tradition that is alternative to the one aforementioned, a tradition that pays attention to pain and suffering as experiences 
that do not undermine human existence and language, but rather constitute it, structure, and even nurture it. Here I argue something that is even more far reaching and perhaps a bit counterintuitive. I argue that there are essential aspects of human existence that we can only access in such extreme moments of suffering. In the last decade, I've been working on cases of what we tend to call negative emotions, feelings or states such as melancholy, loss, mourning, sadness, anxiety, torture and lament. I know it sounds fun. And I've asked again and again and from different directions how these states can be reconsidered philosophically. Pain is a philosophical problem, no longer belongs only to the subject, to the closed capsule of the self, but is transformed into something that we all share. This conception enables shifting the focus from the individual to the world and to society, and from curing my own pain to my responsibility to the suffering of others. So, although it seems that pain draws a line between our feelings of ourselves, and our feelings of others, my pain seems to belong only to me and your pain to you, my work suggests that the experience of pain has the power to create a very deep bond between ourselves and others. To put this more bluntly, pain connects rather than separates us. It has the power to open up realms of our shared existence that cannot be opened up otherwise. In listening to our own pain, we learn to listen to the pains of others. I began by saying that we all know something about pain. I hope that by now something else has also become clear. Sometimes the hardest thing for us to do is to open up anew what is closest to us, what we feel we know all too well, and in this case, the experience of our pain. This is what philosophical thinking does and why I think philosophy has a unique role here. It deals with the big question, those so grand we hardly ever stop to think about. Philosophical thought gives us the necessary space and distance that we sometimes lack from the obvious and seemingly entirely familiar. Going back to pain, it is perhaps true that we can never fully describe or communicate our pain in language to others. However, this does not mean that pain completely isolates us. We do share our vulnerability to pain, which is something that can never be only our own. So when we say we know something about pain, it is never only a knowledge about ourselves, but about how our communal life is constituted, defined and framed by such shared pain. My pain is always also the pain of others and their pain should also be my own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elit. So uh, this uh, basically uh, concludes uh, the Kadar Prize Award of uh, this year. I would like uh, to end by thanking again the Kadar family for the generous uh, uh, support which enabled uh, Tel Aviv University uh, to give this award and to make uh, a tradition out of it, which is ongoing now, as uh, we said, for six years, and we hope it will continue for many years. And uh, I'm looking forward to a competition between all the scientists of the university uh, to get this award in the following years. Ariel, would you like to say any concluding words, please? Yeah, thank you, you have just want to say to Tal, uh, Elite, Ishai and Ronit that we are very proud to have people like you at our university. I enjoyed very much the presentations. So thank you, first of all. And secondly, of course, the Kadar family for your generosity and for encouraging research at Tel Aviv University in this wonderful way. So thank you so much and thank you, Yoav. Thank you, Ariel. Thank every I thank everyone and uh, next year, Dan Peer will uh, take uh, the position and I'm sure he will do the, uh, the job uh, differently, but in a good way. So, thank good you. night to all of you and on this occasion, Shana Tova to everyone. Shana Tova. Shana Tova and thank you. Thank you very much.